Students, morning special guests, a special welcome to the Honorable Mr. David Justice Batts, who is joining us today. Uh, a welcome as well to Haile Mikhail Kojo, um, whose draft forms the subject of our discussion today. And special greetings to the three commissioners who are all experienced teachers in constitutional law in the Faculty of Law, and greetings to all the students in first and second year who will be making submissions today. So the framework for the 2023 public law debate, which is the fifth of the debates, is around the idea of democratic constitutional change and three, four components in this change. Uh, the first is the idea of a citizen draft a draft prepared by a citizen of Jamaica interested in what the new constitution should say and do. But we also have uh, the framework including a constitutional commission, three teachers from the Faculty of Law, and then we have submissions from civil society, um, which comprises students in year one and year two. And those of you who are joining us online or in person, form or constituent assembly. And all of these together comprise our sense of some key elements in a democratic process of constitutional change. We often think of the referendum as uh, the key element of democracy, but the, the process should really begin from the outset and the thinking through of the ideas and the content, hence it being so valuable to have a citizen draft to start the discussion. Um, take note that this series has been taking place since 2018, um, organized by Gabriel L. Elliott Williams, who is on leave and in London, but an online moderator today, Jeffrey Foreman and myself. And the commissioners today are well known to the students of the faculty. Uh, they are Jeffrey Foreman, who has been teaching this course for a considerable period of time. Um, he is a senior assistant attorney general at the attorney general's chambers in Jamaica. We also have a journalist extraordinaire, uh, Dion Jackson Miller, and associate at the firm Livingston Alexander um, and Levy. Uh, we have Catherine Williams, all strong public lawyers in their day-to-day -day work um, and deeply interested in the issues which are before us today. If you are on that side of the podium, you are part of our Constituent Assembly today. Constituent Assemblies are not very familiar to the Caribbean, but they are bodies created to draft or revise a constitution and aimed at ensuring a deeply democratic process involving we the people. Uh, these assemblies are usually representative bodies um, different to parliaments in the jurisdictions. And you can think of the Constituent Assembly in South Africa, in India, um, or the foundational constitutional conventions in the United States. Um, the members may be nominated, the members may be elected, and it's also referred in some jurisdictions as a constitutional convention. We also, as an integral part of this process, have debate masters. And debate masters are really aimed at strengthening peer exchange and peer training. And we have two of the faculty's best graduates in 2022, Akila Southwell of Antigua and Barbuda and Ronaldo Richards of Jamaica. Ronaldo um, was part of the winning team um, at the CCJ moot at the end of last week, which is why you don't see him here today. Um, but the idea is that this process allows students to engage with those just slightly ahead of them, um, but who have themselves developed expertise in supporting others in learning. To say a word about the groups which we're going to meet, there are eight groups. And the first group today will talk about the preamble or what Mr. Kuju calls his declaration. And that group which is making submissions is the Jamaican Sovereignty Coalition, made up of Tanelia Barrett Brown and Clavia Williams McBean. 
We'll hear next from, T from Team Supreme, comprising Selena Evans and Simon Lamb, and they'll be talking about the issues in the Constitution about supremacy, sovereignty, and territory. Third, we'll hear from Jamaicans for Justice and Sovereignty on the question of change and how should the Constitution be entrenched, and they include um, Threshel Essor and Malik Bennett. The fourth group, uh, taking us to the first half of the program, is the repeat offenders. Um, I can warn you that my guess is the commissioners will ask you about your organization, repeat offenders and its name. <laughs> They are comprised of second year students, Amoya Lynn, Sean Vassiani, and Jade Simmons. I should indicate that the first group you'll hear from includes a second year student and a first year student. Most of the groups are first year students, but this group, which has a little bit more time, talking about the Bill of Rights, are second year students in Commonwealth Caribbean human rights law. In the second half, We'll have the Unity Alliance, comprising Nadia Thomas, Tom, Thompson, rather, Liana Jones, and Duane Williams, talking about Parliament as a branch of government. And then two groups are interested in talking about the executive. We have Yendia Barrow and Jessica McKnight, who are the executive detectives. And we also have a, sorry, a second group who are the Democrats making submissions on the executive. And they are, um, and sorry for my um, Zidane scheme, Leila Howell and Jade Martin. Finally, in wrapping up, we have the Caribbean Coalition for Judicial Independence. You may notice, and I hear um, that there are members of the Constituent Assembly who have a particular interest in, this, in these submissions, a group comprising Barbadians and Jamaicans, and they will be looking at issues of judicial independence. Constituent Assembly, you will notice a Mentimeter code on the screen if you haven't yet. You may also see QR codes on the benches and the desks. Um, you are participating all throughout the session and voting using your devices or phones. I'll kindly ask um, that you find the Mentimeter code as we um, get ready to begin our discussions. So our agenda will have us hearing submissions up to the end of the first hour, and then we'll hear the voting on the first four sets of areas, and then we'll take uh, the voting, which you'll be doing throughout the two hours on the second half, right after. I want to end uh, with the words of Simeon McIntosh on why constitutional reform is such an important project in the Caribbean. And he says, the story of origin of our independence constitution, plus the British monarch's continuing presence in the Commonwealth Caribbean political order, continues to foster central notions of our collective identity. West Indian constitutions, he says, remain our most prominent effort at self-definition. They are our principal political projects. And by accepting and adopting them as our own, we purport to share in their conceptions of the world and human nature, to adopt their categories of speech, thought and action to accept their definitions of us as to the kind of people we wish to be. He says, but that critical historical truth that our constitutions came from Britain, that the originating consciousness behind the production of our constitutions was not our own, should make compelling our ambition for a rational reconstruction of a coherent, constitutional narrative that would give expression to a vision of ourselves as a sovereign people, no longer in any ways subordinate to British sovereignty. He says constitutional reform should therefore be 
an occasion for discursive engagement of a Caribbean citizenry on some of the larger questions of constitutional democratic governance, and some of those will emerge today. He says, finally, the current undertaking of constitutional reform, and he was writing 20 years ago before his death, offers us all an auspicious occasion for philosophical reflection on our constitutional tradition and on the possibility of redefining our political and civil identity. Um, we look forward to the submissions, and I want to start by offering the floor to Haile Mikhail Kujo for his brief remarks. Greetings, everyone. Ixabir Yistelin. May God give you good health. Students of the Faculty of Law, University of the West Indies, Mona, I ask you to join me in applauding your lecturer, Ms. Tracy Robinson, for having the wisdom and courage to arrange this conversation between us on the proposed Constitution of Republic Jamaica I wrote with assistance from others whom I credited, some of whom shall remain anonymous. Ms. Robinson, you are as you prepare your students to represent the rights of citizens, it is fitting to allow them to participate in this event, to help to write the future supreme law of our country. I now encourage them that upon graduation, they seek employment on the bench rather than at the bar, as that is where their service is to be most needed in our republic. Thanks again, Ms. Robinson. Students, this proposed constitution is a revolution in that it is geared to turn around the system of governance we have had since Christopher Columbus arrived here. Its aim is to create a new and glorious history for Jamaica by increasing the self-esteem, dignity, and integrity of citizens. This is in fulfillment of right excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey's statement, we have a glorious history and will create one in the future that will astonish the world. Therefore, a new way of thinking, a mentally emancipated way of thinking is needed when dealing with this document. Monday, October 16, 2023 is the date I have set for its implementation after it is signed by our members of parliament, Maroon leaders and the Taino chief all 70 of whom have received a copy of the December 12, 2022 revision. I told both groups that I am available to discuss it with them whenever they need me to do so. Some critics have asked me, who gave you the authority to write this constitution? I tell them, Almighty God. Some do not accept this, but it is he, our eternal father, who has prepared me for the task and continues to facilitate me in every way to ensure it is written because our country, Jamaica, land we love, needs it. I obtained my legal education from my life's experiences that include reading, among other documents, the Holy Bible, the writings of Marcus Garvey and Emperor Haile Selassie I, the United Nations Charter, the constitutions of Jamaica, the United States of America, the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated and the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church, current events in newspapers, legally based novels and biographies, watching movies and television shows based on law, plus listening to our music of the 1970s that contain commentary on the ills of our society and suggestions to correct them. Sadly, while I was a teenager, I played the music so loud through the headphones that I now sometimes have difficulty hearing. I beg you, please save your hearing by keeping the volume low, especially when using headphones. I therefore am one of whom Daddy Marcus spoke when he said, many a man was educated outside the schoolroom. This is part of the legacy I inherited from my parents, neither of whom attended secondary school. 
They were self-motivated to seek knowledge that led them to become managers in the Jamaica Telephone Company in St. Anne's Bay during the late 1970s through to the early 1990s. They also taught me justice, summed up in acting out, in acting out this saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Note carefully the following quote. No one will fail to appreciate that law is the greatest benefit to man. It is through the equity of law that honor and advantage arise. It is through the deficiency of law that damage and distress result. It is through failure to set up law that injury and insult grow. While God, being above all creatures, would not find it difficult to issue orders by his word alone, yet his instituting law is because he knew that law should be the supreme ruler of the whole world. That quote is the assessment of law made by Emperor Haile Selassie I in his autobiography as he spoke of the 1931 constitution he gave to Ethiopia, it being the first written one for that creation old country. The emperor also helped to write the United Nations Charter and that of the Af Organization of African Unity. Indeed, on his 1966 royal visit to Jamaica, this university awarded him an honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. It is one of many honors he received that afforded him the Guinness Book of World Records title, Most Bemedaled Man in History. Yet, I have been criticized for using his 1955 revised constitution of Ethiopia as a model for the one I wrote, which, as far as I know, is the only one in existence that is crafted by us, specifically for us, that rids us of the British monarchy. I also sent it to many government ministries and agencies, over 70 lawyers and law firms, the Jamaica Council of Churches, many media houses and journalists, three political parties, 17 trade unions, 10 civil society and human rights organizations, three Rastafarian groups, the security forces, and over 700 Jamaican citizens and counting at home and abroad. And I am not done yet. Students, you have a copy, and I am now ready to face your critical assessment as we work at developing the perfect document to govern our country, Jamaica, land we love, in justice and truth, under our eternal Father, Almighty God, our Creator, to whom be glory, honor, and majesty. Let's get it on. Oh, yeah. Let's get it on. I thank you. hand over now to the commissioners. Morning, everybody. Okay, you see why constitutional law is so exciting? I tell my students every day, you're studying a subject and the entire Jamaica, the entire Caribbean and world is actually your, your classroom. Here you're getting an opportunity to participate in critical analysis of a serious attempt at constitution making by a citizen. That's what you call participatory democracy in action, the discursive engagement that Professor Simeon Mackin just spoke of in that quote that um, Professor Robinson showed on screen. Just want to say congratulations to her for organizing this, this extraordinary event, which is going to be a huge teaching and learning exercise for all of us who are here. Congratulations, sir, for your obvious work and thought that you have put into this process. And even before any of you students open your mouth, I just want to say congratulations to you for having stepped up to do this. It's I know you have exam coming up, I know you have assignments, and the easy thing to do, the safe thing to do would have been to say, boy, may I stay in my room, I'm, I'm beat my book here. But growth never came from playing it safe, growth never came from playing it easy. And I hope in the work you've done so far, as well as in the respectful interactions that we're going to be having over the next two hours, that you will feel the benefit of your bravery, because I know we all will. So just to finally remind you, stay to time, be respectful, and breathe, all right? On a can do this, all right.
All right, uh, welcome everyone. The uh, debate will now begin. Uh, the first group are, uh, the, is the Jamaican Sovereignty Coalition consisting of Tanelia Barif and Clavia Williams. Please welcome them to the platform. <laughs> All right, so groups will have uh, three minutes to present. Uh, the commissioners will, from time to time, ask questions, and uh, we will you know, give us some additional time if we, if we think necessary uh, based on the questions that, that we ask. So go ahead. All right, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Writing about the preamble of constitutional interpretation in the International Journal of Constitutional Law, Lev Orgad explains that the preamble requires specific content. It presents the history behind the Constitution's enactment, as well as the nation's core principles and values. Speaking more specifically to the Caribbean context, Baron P. and Anderson J. stated, the preamble of the Constitution cannot be treated as mere surplusage, meaning unnecessary or irrelevant. And they quoted Justice Witt and stated that the CCJ has recognized the normative function served by the preamble. They fill the Constitution with meaning, reflecting the very essence, values, and logic of constitutional democracies. These normative parts of the Constitution breathe life into the clay of the more formal provisions of the document. This leads to the questions, what history gave rise to Jamaica's Constitution? What are Jamaica's core principles and values? What are the essence and logic of Jamaica's constitutional democracy? Um, this, this Jamaica Sovereignty Coalition, uh, Jamaica has had a constitution for 60 years now. Uh, we've not had a, a preamble, and we seem to be going on quite fine. Um, why, why should we accept uh, Koja's recommendation to have a preamble now? All right, so the issue of a preamble, as it says, it breathes life into the document. And we, are, we have seen in cases, for example, the Miami Legal Alliance, where judges have referred to what is put into the preamble as a, as a part of how they interpret constitutional provisions. So, for example, in that case, because Belize refers to their, um, their allegiance to or their hope to um, um, make sure that they're living up to or staying true to their international obligations, the international law was used to interpret whether or not the Mayans had rights in Belize. So even though the preamble is considered not justiciable, not justiciable, we've seen where the courts are relying on it in terms of interpreting the whole document. All right. As Jamaicans, and by scrutinizing the national anthem and pledge, we know that Jamaica's history is rooted in colonialism. Additionally, our recurrent values include justice, brotherhood, freedom, equality, independence or sovereignty, and service to country. These values are reflected in the preamble of Haile Mikhail's draft constitution to some extent. His preamble refers to our colonial past. It also reflects our valuing of freedom, independence, and nationalism through the stated purpose of the draft, that is, removing for all time every remnant of the brutality committed against our citizens of the past and present by the British monarchy. However, there is an imbalance between our historical foundation and our present and future values and essence. Additionally, the reference of the Maroons also creates confusion about the relationship between the Maroons and Jamaicans. We believe the essence of Jamaica is not in the fact that we were subjected to slavery and the slave trade, but our triumphs despite our brutal past. We believe that our vision of ourselves now and for the future should be more reflective of a brotherhood, equality, service to country, and justice that is required for our individual and collective prosperity. In formulating this position, we examine the preambles of the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, Ethiopia as referenced by Haile Mikhail, and South Africa. In these Commonwealth countries, the preamble contains an acknowledgement of the past, but they also assert a core vision of their countries, which present a more positive outlook rather than seeming to be focused solely well, they, on past they, brutality and injustice. Some, some, some might say that the, the past is the past. Um, why, why should we um, use the Constitution to um, dwell upon what happened um, before? Um, shouldn't the document simply be a forward-looking document that speaks solely to our aspirations for, for the future? 
All right, so the past is not the past, and it just doesn't stay there, because if we don't examine our past, we have a greater likelihood of history repeating itself. We can learn lessons from the past, and our past is important to who we are as a people and how we should move forward. The fact that we are having this debate about constitutional reform is our understanding that in the past we came this far, but we need to go a little bit further by making our constitution for Jamaican and of Jamaican. so we can't leave the past in the past. You criticize the draft of the Constitution for, um, you, you say, referring to the colonial past, and you say that the essence of Jamaica is not the fact we're subjected to slavery and so on. Doesn't the fact, though, that the Declaration speak to, speaks to creating a new and glorious future for ourselves and future generations, mm -hmm. and declaring we're seeking to banish colonial brutality, doesn't that in itself lay out what the constitution maker is hoping for in terms of a vision for Jamaica? Why do we need more? And that's why we say to an extent, to some extent that those goals were accomplished. But if we look, for example, at the preamble in the constitution of South Africa, it says, we the people of South Africa recognize the injustices of our past, honor those who have suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country. But it also says that they're putting forward this constitution as the supreme law of the republic so as to heal the division of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. So we're seeing the acknowledgement of the past, but we're seeing something more. We're seeing a more prosperous or a more positive future. And we believe that the constitution should be forward looking and give us that hope, give us that sense that, all right, we have something to live forward to, look, look forward to and be proud of. Not just the fact that we went through slavery, we went through the slave trade, Britain has subjected us for so many years. Our story is bigger than that and I would want that to be reflected in the highest Thank you. law in our country. Um, our final question is, why do you say that the reference to Maroons in the preamble is creating some confusion as to their status in society? All right, um, so we have, the, the issue of maroon sovereignty is contentious. At the moment, we have our prime minister who says that Jamaica is a unitary sovereign country, and we have the maroons who are asserting their sovereignty. Um, people have the argument of it being a state within a state. Now, if we are, if, if maroons are sovereign, why should they be included in the constitution um, this, uh, of Jamaica, which I've never seen a constitution making reference to another sovereign state in their constitution. And if they are not sovereign, then seeing that we are a pluralistic society, why is it that the Maroons should be signatories in our constitution and not any other re religious group, any other Thank ethnic you. group in our, in our country? Thank you very much, uh, Jamaica and Sovereignty Coalition. Um, I think you've represented your views quite, quite well and have given the the assembly and us as commissioners, uh, something to think about in um, taking the, the next steps. Right, um, thank you. Please applaud them. Uh, for those um, in the as assembly, you will see that the first uh, question is now uh, available for, for response. Um, so you use the, the Mentimeter link to um, indicate your a list of some core values that should be in the preamble. Uh, we will see your responses um, after we've heard from the fourth of the uh, civil society groups um, in, this, in this forum. So we now move on to the second team. This is uh, Team Supreme, um, um, cons um, consisting of uh, Selena Evans and Simon Lamb and uh, they will discuss uh, supremacy, sovereignty, and territory. Team Supreme, go ahead. Members of the Constituency Assembly, members of the Commission, Sir Justice Batis, and special guest Sir Kojo, good morning. The Constitution ought to be an unassailable instrument of law. It is the supreme law against which all other laws are judged. Collymore reminds us that no one can disobey the Constitution with impunity. Our submission today is built on this principle and has been drafted to allow the Constitution to attain its true and intended status as the supreme law of Jamaica. The problem currently facing our Constitution is that it is subservient to outdated and oppressive savings law clauses. Arguably, 
these provisions were useful as a transitionary period in the immediate post-independence Jamaica. Today, however, they are unnecessary and they hinder the development of local jurisprudence. General and special savings law clauses preserve English laws, surrender our independence, and weaken our constitution. Of the three, only modification clauses truly represent who the people are today, ultimately obeying the doctrine of constitutional supremacy. We applaud Kujo's draft for excluding savings law clauses and allowing for the development of local jurisprudence. We strongly urge all Caribbean countries to follow suit. When we explore the CCJ's decision in Nervis and the Privy Council's decision in Reynolds, we see that sometimes there is room for modification, especially for laws that highlight the British colonial masters not recognizing certain rights. Pre-constitutional era for the purpose of slavery, unlawful detention was permitted. So today, does that mean we have to ignore the rights to reasonable detention? No. By revising the current law to bring it in compliance with the Constitution, Privy Council was able to reconcile, reconcile a conflict between existing law and a basic right. In Reynolds, the question was whether the general savings provision of the state's 1967 independence constitution protected a 1959 pre-constitution emergency powers law of St. Kitts and Nevis and Anguilla. According to the Privy Council, it is unimaginable that a constitution like the one we have now, which is primarily intended to defend the fundamental rights and freedom, would allow for a statute that conferred unfettered power to arrest and detain without a reasonable and probable cause. But Team Supreme, um, Jamaica amended its human rights provisions um, in 2011, and in so doing, got rid of the general savings law clause, but maintained others and included um, other types of um, shutout provisions. Yes, okay. sir. Um, wasn't that an, an exercise of the independent Jamaican people acting through their elected representatives, um, choosing to um, indicate that some legislation should not be the subject of judicial review? Um, why, why should we depart from, from that? We still have other saving law clauses. So though there was the exclusion of the general one with the inclusion of the 2011 provision, though we have that, there are still special saving law clauses. Team Supreme were saying, we, d we, don't want any special we don't want any saving law clause at all, except if it is that the clause will be modified to represent who we are as a people today. But, but why, why shouldn't the effect of the savings clauses is that the, the courts can't change certain types of ordinary legislation, but the parliament can change those um, laws if it wishes. Uh, what's wrong with having parliament decide when it's time to um, move on from a particular type of um, ordinary legislation that limits human rights? Nothing is wrong with that, per se, but I think what Parliament has been doing with keeping savings law is that we have been we have been allowing for convenience. So because the savings law provide a sense of convenience in the sense that it doesn't because you you cannot challenge it, it can be amended, but because it cannot be challenged right it gives parliament a sense of a safe space right so there's there's no incentive to actively review and amend um the the, the laws is what you say yes that's exactly what i'm saying Can continue thank you Therefore, some existing laws need either modification or complete removal. Saving law clauses chain us to the mentality and the opinions of our oppressive past, and they prevent us from accepting the progress we have made. What good is the recognition of rights, such as freedom from inhuman punishment, if saving law clauses will ignore these rights? Regardless, and we can look at Hines and Chandler. Every time we obey a savings law clause, we root ourselves deeper in the past that the colonists have cultivated for us. In addition, savings law clauses allow us to be governed by laws that are not ours. If Santa Claus doesn't come to Jamaica, savings law clauses should not either.
McIntosh highlights that these clauses permit laws we did not draft in the past, nor do we agree with in the present, to continue to preside over our lives. Section 26 of the Barbadian Constitution is an example of this, as it allows for the general preservation of old British laws, regardless of their unconstitutionality. It openly embraces old British law while rejecting the power of the Barbadian Constitution. The only acceptable form of savings law clauses are modification clauses. These clauses are acceptable because they work in conjunction with the supremacy doctrine of the Constitution, that all laws are void to the extent of their inconsistency with the Constitution. They serve as a compromise, allowing for the preservation of old law while preventing it from conflicting with the Constitution. All right, thank you very much, Team Supreme. That's your, your time, very innovative presentation. Um, and we will take your, your comments into consideration. Um, members of the Assembly, the second uh, question is up. Uh, I now invite uh, Jamaicans for Justice and Sovereignty uh, to approach the, the platform. Um, yeah. This team uh, um, is made up of Teresa Esso and Malik Bennett, and they will ma be making submissions on infringement. Um, J Up, up, up. We can never rid ourselves of technical I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Jamaicans for Justice and Sovereignty, with respect to Haile Mikhail Kuju's constitutional draft, Chapter 7, Article 86, endeavors to enrich this significant contribution by proposing a mindful view that degrees of entrenchment in a democratic society is justified and relevant for mature consideration. Firstly, throughout this discussion, We'll explore the effect of excluding deep levels of entrenchment devices such as referenda and delay mechanisms. Secondly, the impact of Article 86 on a dynamic society. And finally, I will endeavor to articulate the value of Article 86 as a solution to the bar of entrenchment by infection. Firstly, Article 86 does not reflect a use of referendum and delayed mechanisms in tax for reform, which in effect eliminates public intent. As Professor Tracy Robinson states, the levels of entrenchment fosters a robust participation of civil society to gain acquaintance with the amending provision, ventilate views on it, and possibly mount a campaign against it. Similarly, this allows Parliament to assess the opinions of the constituents thereon. Comparisons may be drawn across the region of constitutions of Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Guyana, and Dominica. To my second point, we need be mindful that a blanket form of deep level of entrenchment protect provisions that need stringent protections. However, whilst it is essential to balance or aim to protect such arms of government and institutions that need protection, it is also our responsibility to allow progress with change in society. A society is not static, it is dynamic. Furthermore, there is value in having degrees of entrenchment which allows provisions that warrant deep levels of entrenchment to be given the significance it requires. Finally, Article 86 is essential to the Bill of Rights and the, concepts of, and, and the concept of judicial independence. But more importantly, Article 86 is an effective means to eliminate the challenge that was posed by the device of entrenchment by infection. This would allow for a prevention of what was witnessed in IJCHR, where this amounted to a label by the then esteemed Counsel David Bott, who characterized the court as a high puppet court. To conclude, whilst Article 86 of the draft is essential to protection of vital provisions of the Constitution in a democratic society, it is justified and relevant to include other degrees of entrenchment that allows for mature consideration. Thank you. Question. My understanding is that you're criticizing the draft for not 
containing a mechanism for referendum by way of the defense level of entrenchment? So not incorporating the varying degrees of uh, entrenchment, such as referendum, the Cor name. Correct. Now, at 2016, Bahamas referendum to confer equal rights on women and men to allow them to confer citizenship to their spouses and children failed in a referendum, just one of many that have failed in the Caribbean. Isn't this an indication that the referendum is in fact a far too restrictive way of amending constitutions and in fact are defeating the very purpose of the constitution as a living document and that therefore this draft constitution should perhaps be praised for not including the referendum mechanism? Thank you for your question, ma'am. Firstly, we feel that referenda is not the only means of change, but we do encourage incorporating it simply because, not because referendum doesn't always succeed means it cannot exceed, um, succeed. And we feel that if... Can you give me an example where it has? Well, perhaps... In the, in the Commonwealth Caribbean. I understand. But perhaps if our leaders invited participation more by having town halls and educating the citizens and those who vote and participate in voting, then perhaps we could witness a different outcome. But since we've not yet reached that level of participation, it really restricts the ability for referenda to succeed in the region. Thank you. So you're, you're encouraging more forward like this? Yes, sir. Good answer. Um, what, would you, what would you recommend um, in the Constitution to be subject to a referendum mechanism as opposed to a mechanism that's limited to Parliament? If we're going to make anything like we've witnessed in the case of Times where they tried to put forward uh, the Gun Court Act, so if, if perhaps Parliament is legislating on anything that has to do with Chapter 7, the present Chapter 7 that deals with the judiciary, then perhaps that is a significant enough uh, provision of the Constitution that should warrant uh, a participation from the public through referendum. Um, should the human rights provisions be subject to referendum procedure? Human rights uh, would, would indeed reflect uh, a need for the public to have a say as this affects their rights as citizens and how they're treated in comparison to what the, the rest of persons in the world is facing on that level. I think what my, co my fellow commissioner is getting at is a tyranny of the majority and the fact that if you, there's a concern that if you put human rights provisions to referendum, the majority will always vote in, in against provisions they may disagree with for religious or other personal reasons, but that strike at the heart of protecting minority and vulnerable groups. Does that change your answer? Well, that does not change my answer. It just makes the responsibility of our leaders a bit more arduous by ensuring that the public understands what they're voting on and the impact of what it is they're called to vote on. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jamaicans for Justice and, and Sovereignty. Thank you. Uh, and as, as you will see, uh, the third um, question for the Assembly is now, is now up. Um, I hope you all have been voting and letting your views be be known. Uh, the fourth uh, group are the repeat offenders, um, consisting of Amaya Lynn, Jade Simmons, and Sean Vassiani. And interestingly enough, they will be uh, commenting on the Bill of Rights. Uh, repeat offenders, the floor is yours. Um, sir. Um, would you, would you need an, another microphone? Or, okay. All right, proceed. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. Good morning. My name is Jade Simmons, and I'm joined today by Sean Bassiani and Amoya Lynn of Repeat Offenders. After a careful consideration of Mr. Kojo's draft con constitution, we have identified three main areas as it relates to the Bill of Rights on which we'd like to comment, and we will do so in turn. We will look at savings law clauses, the limitation of rights, and children's rights. Firstly, savings law clauses, or well, shutout clauses specifically, aim to protect laws before an appointed date from being held as inconsistent with the Constitution. As such, they have come, come under much scrutiny, primarily by Simeon McIntosh, who states that they are a barrier to the realization of rights. However, cases such as Watson and R demonstrate that they do have some usefulness as they secure an orderly transition from colonial rule to independence. We suggest that this transition is also needed in times of constitutional reform. However, we should be sure not to abuse these clauses as has been done in the Commonwealth Caribbean. In Jamaica, for example, it has been 12 years since the new charter has been introduced, and yet still we still have savings law clauses in 1312 and 137 of the Jamaican Constitution. But does, does, does that mean that the theory of transition that the cases of Watson, for example, um, applied to the savings provisions are outdated, and maybe we need to reconsider um, the purpose that the savings clauses now, now serve. Um, I, th I, th I think in, in the Chandler case, the, um, the Privy Council noted that the Trinidad and Tobago Constitution, uh, despite the fact that it was amended when they became a republic, um, the savings provisions there did not, uh, were, not, were not changed, which reflected a democratic preference for excluding certain uh, matters from judicial scrutiny. Well, I don't think that is the purpose of the savings law clause. A savings law clause is there to provide for this type of transition. If it is that based on majority or parliament wants to keep certain laws on the books that might limit rights, then parliament should be prepared to show that it is demonstrably justified per 13.2 as the constitution provides for. It shouldn't be that they're relying on the savings law clause to do that job for them, which it was not set out to be used for. Okay. So to continue, like I said, we should not abuse these clauses. Um, and I understand, you know, the potential for political fallout, as I just stated. However, um, the savings law clauses are not to be used for this purpose. So we suggest that Mr. Kojo would consider having a savings law clause or a few savings law clauses in his draft constitution. However, to prevent the abuse, we should adopt an approach taken similar to Belize um, in their 1981 constitution as they had a five-year time is, limit is, is, on the clause. Why, why, why would you advocate for um, a time limitation if you don't think that the savings clauses um, are, are tenable at all? Um, no, we're saying that they can be useful. So we're saying that they have been abused in the Caribbean, but we're saying that they can be useful. And in order to ensure that they are used for the correct purpose, we, will, we should implement a time limit. Well, just piggybacking on what my um, fellow commissioner said, in your written submissions, you said that savings law clauses need to be repealed. So are you um, not adopting that position anymore? Um, I'm speaking specifically to 1312 and 1307 in the Jamaican Constitution, as I'm saying that there has been enough time for the transitory phase to be completed. So now Jamaica needs to repeal our savings law clauses, but in adopting a whole new constitution, there is a need for savings law clauses. Okay, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. So I will be speaking a bit on limitation clauses. I will be speaking a bit on limitation clauses. So Article 1D of Mr. Kudrow's constitution Article 1D of Mr. Kujo's constitution is a limitation clause which qualifies the scope of the rights and freedoms listed in Articles 13 to 30. It refers to public order and general welfare. It refers to public order and general welfare as the only reasons for limiting rights listed in Chapter 1. The language used in Excuse Mr. Kujo's... Excuse me, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to respectfully suggest to you that you may have misread the section. When you look at Article 1D, it says respect for the rights and freedoms of others. 
and the requirements of public order and the general welfare shall alone justify any limitations upon the rights. Please Is that going to change your submission, no, the no. fact that the section clearly spells out that reasons for limitations would also include respect for rights and freedoms of others? Thank you for that correction. It won't change my submission. So the language used in Mr. Kojo's draft constitution differs from the language used in 13.2 of Jamaica's constitution, demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, as well as other limitation clauses across the Commonwealth Caribbean, such as St. Lucia, which uses reasonably required. However, it may still be amenable to some of the same principles of interpretation, including the Oaks test and rules concerning the burden of proof. One area of recent controversy concerns whether legislation which abrogates Bill of Rights provisions are rendered unconstitutional by the potential existence of less intrusive means of limiting those rights. The UK Privy Council in Attorney General and Jamaica Bar Association exemplifies that the Privy Council interprets these limitation clauses as allowing for a margin of appreciation. However, other judges in the Caribbean, including Chief Justice Sykes in NIDS, have disagreed with the idea of a margin of appreciation being applied and suggest a more literal interpretation of the term least intrusive. According to Professor Ventos, the former approach lends too much to judicial deference and works against constitutional supremacy. This limitation clause could serve as an excellent opportunity to clarify the preferred approach for Jamaica. In the context of a proposed constitution that has a single limitation um, provision, and is very open-ended in, in the language that, that it uses. And in light of the fact that, um, you know, rights, rights conflict, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you may have the right to free speech conflicting with um, um, the right to um, um, well, some other right in the Constitution, etc. Um, and the Parliament oftentimes has to strike a balance um, between these competing rights and duties and sometimes there may be a range of reasonable types of limitations that um, um, could arguably um, apply. Isn't that the, the reason why having some degree of margin of appreciation or um, deference to the political branches is necessary in a constitution such as, such as this? Thank to you preserve for that um, balance between judicial power and the power of the, the political branches? Yes, thank you for that question. I'm not necessarily suggesting that a literal interpretation of least intrusive is inherently superior to allowing a range of reasonable options. I'm just trying to say that Mr. Kojo's constitution could serve as a great opportunity to clarify and deal with some of the contention that has existed between local courts and the Privy Council on this matter. We, we look forward to some more, some more detailed submissions on how the clarification could be, could be achieved. Uh, the, uh, oh, go ahead, yes. Yes, maybe the language, maybe a provision could be added which explicitly lists out um, whether the preferred approach is least intrusive um, and that if that actually would be vitiated by measures which are less intrusive. Okay. So you want, you want, you want to... Um, uh, codify the, 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 the elements of the old yes, text. I would say that. Okay, I see. That's interesting. All right. Thank you. I think there's one more item left, and um, you're, we'll, we'll allow some more time because of the, um, the breadth of the submissions. But. Okay. So, children are considered a vulnerable class, and therefore they're more susceptible to human rights violations. Therefore, we believe that they should be afforded special protection under the Bill of Rights. Now, we know that there's no age limit on the rights enshrined in the Constitution. However, we believe that attention must be given to the special situation of the child. Section 13K of the Jamaican Constitution does recognize this to some extent, but we believe it lacks the expansive and specific approach needed as seen in Articles 27, 28, 38, 49, and 154 of the Guyanese Constitution. These provisions within the Guyanese Constitution for children are in line with their international obligations under the CRC, which has also been ratified by Jamaica and is potentially, potentially customary international law. 
Now, it can be argued that the legislation, the Child Care and Protection Act, does afford further protection for children. However, this has only partially incorporated the CRC, and we believe that full incorporation should be sufficient. We suggest that Mr. Kojo should consider including an explicit provision in his constitution for the protection of children, as his constitution only has, at Article 6, st states that it only states the rights that children do not have, such as they do not have the right to vote, marriage, consent, or participate in parliament. This language does not evoke the idea that they are inherent rights of the children, but instead that they lack rights because they are not adults. We believe that the constitution should give explicit protection to children and, if necessary, adopt the approach used in the Guyanese constitution as an example. Uh, why have you given um, specific um, focus on on children? Um, are, are, are there other groups in the society that may need um, special recognition and protection? What about the indigenous peoples? Um, what about um, the poor, um, 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 religious minorities, and so on? I believe that they do need protection, but I specifically talked about children in relation to Mr. Kojo's draft constitution, because I recognize that the language that he may have used, it did not explicitly state that the constitution was protecting children. And I think, as I stated before, while those groups are also in need of protection, I think children are vulnerable and they are susceptible to more violations because of their status as minors in society. All right, thank you very much, um, repeat um, offenders. Um, assembly, please give them your thanks. Uh, so we will, uh, uh, so the fourth question is up and uh, um, shortly you'll be seeing some of the uh, responses um, from the polling results. I'll hand over to Professor Robinson for this. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, so we're going to share some of the results. Um, hopefully the Constituent Assembly is vibrant and active and voting. And we apologize to the online audience because of the poor internet um, connection at the moment. We haven't been able to stream effectively. So we're starting with um, the first question, and um, this is going to test my eyesight. Uh, about the preambles, but you can see some of the values which persons thought should be in the preambles. Freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, um, the need for protection, supremacy of the constitution, um, brotherhood, maybe sisterhood too, uh, respect, uh, uh, protecting the rights of indigenous peoples. These are all important ones which are mentioned. Fraternity. Um, protection of the law as well. Thank you very much. Could we see some of the results of the second question? Oh, no one? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> For a minute there. So this was, should judges be the guardians of the Constitution? And um, 13 persons said yes, um, but we also had a larger number which said all three branches of government should be integrally involved in protecting the supremacy of the Constitution. Thank you very much. Could we see the next question too? Should the Jamaica Constitution acknowledge maroon lands? Um, and here we have an even tag for yes and no. Uh, well, people are voting at the same time. So we see 12 and 12 uh, with persons saying yes and no. So interestingly, this is a polemical issue. Um, and I would only say that I, I don't think the question is, is necessarily about sovereignty for all Maroons, uh, but respect um, for their communities and their land. Uh, can I see the next question? On amendments and the, the use of referendum, should the requirement of referendum be removed? And the vast majority said no. Um, a minority said yes, despite the lack of success with referenda everywhere in the Caribbean since independence. I think we have had success in the Cayman Islands. Uh, next one, quickly. Should there be a single procedure for amending the Constitution? Overwhelmingly, no. People think there should be varying levels of entrenchment to facilitate amendment of different provisions. And coming up to the last few, 
Uh, so the repeat offenders group, um, we, we asked about a social and economic right, the right to health. And a large majority thought that we should be including social and economic rights like the right to the highest attainable standard of health and care. Notably, uh, the Constitutional Commission created in the late 90s didn't wish to proceed in this direction. It's going to be important for upcoming reforms. And the last one before we move on to the next half, what's your opinion on savings law clauses? You can tell this generated a lot of interest with the supremacy group and the last group. Uh, and um, we heard the progressive decisions in, of the CCJ, Nervais, and McEwan should be applied. Uh, savings law clauses are problematic in one view. Um, they should be excluded. Um, it may be, it is necessary to prevent inconsistency. They should be included. So strong differences of opinion on this one. Um, thank you very much, Constituent Assembly. We will be returning to you through groups five to eight. Back to you, Commissioners. Okay. Thank you, Professor Robinson. Uh, we continue. Uh, the next group is the Unity Alliance. Uh, this group consists of uh, Liana Jones, Nordia Thompson, and uh, Dwayne Williams. And they will be presenting on uh, fixed elections and the composition of, of parliament. Um, we, we will have to listen very carefully to, to, to this group. We uh, didn't have the advance um, copy of your text, but we'll, we'll do our best. Good morning, everyone. Unity Alliance comprises of Duane Williams, myself, Norda Thompson, and in her absence, Liana Jones. Should the decision for the date of an election be left solely to the Prime Minister? The Prime Minister of Jamaica, for example, has unique responsibility for announcing the date of an election. But aren't we an independent state? Why then is the date of an ele election left at the secrecy and autonomy of the Prime Minister? We the people must be privy to the date of an election and within reasonable time. It is for reasons such as these, we, the members of Unity Alliance, strongly concurs with the proposal of Kojo's Republican Constitution of entrenching fixed election dates. Well, um, one of the benefits of a flexible system is that it allows a parliament that has become, for want of a better word, stale, um, to be dissolved and a fresh democratic mandate selected. And we saw in the United Kingdom a couple of years ago when they had problems with um, Brexit and so on, the Prime Minister wanted to um, go back to the people for a fresh mandate and, and he couldn't do that. Why, why stifle why the, the, the Prime Minister in this respect? Well, it's really not stifling. I believe the people one, which is the, imp the major important source, should not be left in a limbo, as they call it, as to when the date of an election should be or will be. And also in terms of self-serving, it appears as if the government will be self-serving -ser somehow. And we draw reference to the Prime Minister of Barbados. Mia Motley, when shortly after she was elected into power, she called another election. So it's really at her own benefit, the Prime Minister's benefit, instead of the people. But doesn't the fact that the Constitution, as it now stands, does have a, a check and balance in terms of the fact that the government is unable to go more than five months and change the before, before Parliament dissolved, doesn't that place uh, an effective check on the, on the power of the Prime Minister to do as he or she wishes. It does, but to some extreme, because we realize the, govern play, the government or the Prime Minister can play on this in terms of what is benefit, uh, beneficial or suitable. No, I'm so sorry, perhaps I didn't phrase my question properly. I'm saying even though the Prime Minister has that discretion, the discretion is, is limited by the five-year period. Isn't that enough, is what I'm asking? No, it is not enough. I still um, believe that even though it is limited, we have um, evidence where they have been acting upon this um, extension or time limit in which they still have the autonomy to call. Can you tell us what evidence you're referring to? 
Well, we speak about the last election, for example, here in Jamaica, where um, the government, even though the discretion is left to him and there's a limited time, he still calls the election whenever he feels like and within time that seems to be so short spanned. Thank you. Article 48C of Codras Republican Constitution proposes fixed election dates. We, the Unity Alliance, strongly agrees with the provisions of this debate that entrenches a fixed election date. The conversation of fixed election dates in Jamaica was rekindled by the government's decision to postpone the local government elections. Historically, the ability for a government to decide the date of an election is highly political. Incumbent government frequently use their ability to, to unilaterally trigger an election for particular motives. English constitutional scholars Robert Blackburn notes, and I quote, a prime minister sets an election date at the time when he thinks he's most likely to win. Conversely, he will avoid such times as he's likely to lose. This allows for the governing body to have unfair advantages over the party in the opposition. This sentiment was echoed by former opposition senator of Barbados, Coswell Franklin, in his reaction to the calling of the election by Prime Minister Mayor Motley, and I quote, at this stage of our development, we should not be at the whim and fancy of every single people. One should believe that this would be an easy sell. However, there are some contention around the constitutionality of fixed election dates. Codras provision solves the problem our current constitution creates around the ability of the head of state to dissolve parliament. Critiques such as Eugene Forsey have argued that the Queen's representative royal prerogative is to dissolve or prolong parliament at any point. It is believed that a fixed election forces the Queen's representative to either call an election or a prolonged parliament infringing on the power of the Governor General set out in the Constitution. On this basis, it could be argued that a fixed election date infringes on Section 641 of the Jamaican Constitution, which allows our head to proclaim the dissolution of Parliament. In the case of Attorney General v. Richardson, the CCJ held that the terms limit did not dilute the democracy or the sovereignty of the people. Democracy may benefit from increased opportunities for ascendancy to the highest leadership by limiting tenure of the presidency to two terms. All right, um, that's, that's, I think we get the um, thrust of the, the submission there. Uh, very, very strong support for uh, Kojo's recommendation of a fixed um, election date because it will remove um, arbitrariness in the, the decision and um, eliminate political gamesmanship. That's, that's the essence of it. Um, but your time uh, is so that's <laughs> cutting you short. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Unity Alliance. Um, uh, a very good name because it um, has that ring of um, some coalitions that we see in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, the next group, and you see that more questions are on the, the Mentimeter, get voting. Uh, we now have the executive directives. Uh, this group consists, detectives, sorry. Um, my mind is somewhere else. Uh, ha we have before us now Jessica McKnight and Yende Abara, and they will speak on changes to the executive um, in comparison with the Jamaican and US constitutions. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, everyone. The conversation surrounding constitutional reform is an age-old one that is bound to all of us. Jamaica is no stranger to constitutional proposals. However, the proposed constitution of the Republic of Jamaica, drafted by Haile Kuju, is the focal point of the executive detective's presentation. With a specific focus on the transitioning of the prime minister into the head of state, the proposed changes to the executive arm of government will be critically examined. 
The Prime Minister will be elected by the citizens in the Republic of Jamaica. This, to our mind, is a welcome change. The head of state is currently determined by the Prime Minister in their capacity as the head of government. There exists a disconnect between the executive and the citizens. This is strange as the executive guides government policy that impacts the wider population. Citizens are thus encouraged to take part in the election processes as their vote holds significant weight. The head of state will truly be the people's choice. Um, question here. You, you're putting a lot of weight on the vote of the people, but in progressive elections since independence, we have seen steadily decline, uh, declining um, voting, voting participation. The last election we had a record, I think it was 37% participation in the general election and this has been a steady trend and if this is what we're going to be seeing in elections how is electing the prime minister going to end up with the people's choice if 60 odd percent of the people aren't participating in the process um thank you for that i feel like the declining of trend in the voter turnout is a symptom of them feeling as if their vote does not have weight because we see that a lot of times they'll vote for who they feel is going to represent them and they find out when it really, when the wheel really hits the road, there is nothing to be said of the promises that has come to them. But with exposure to the, to the role that the Prime Minister will play as a head of state and the amount of power given to the head of state and then placing that power into the hands of the voter, I believe that there will be a spark of hope in the voter to come out and to vote for who they really want to be in charge of them. The Prime Minister's powers as set out in Article 33, E to I, demonstrate an extensive amount of power given to a single individual. The cabinet is selected by the prime minister with or without the advice of anyone. Qualified individuals can be anyone, including representatives. The strong sense of separation of power is jeopardized when a single authority rules over both arms. In Guyana's executive presidential system, a similar setup is discovered. The head of government has the propensity to become the head of state. The president is broadly immune. The president exercises executive authority directly or through subordinate officers that are appointed and removed by him. They are at his pleasure. In this respect, the magnitude of power granted to the head of state is comparable to the proposed system. Guyana's 1999 constitutional reform introduced a two consecutive term limit to curb the concentration of power. The safeguards in place to ensure a democracy as outlined in Kuja's draft are Article 33, B and C. To further protect democracy and balance the powers of the prime ministers, term limits are proposed. Article 34D explicitly states that there shall be no term limits. To combat the concentration of power, a two-term limit is proposed. Um, sorry, a uh, question. Um, one critique of the um, direct election of, a, of the executive um, is that it may lead to a situation where the prime minister is, for example, from one party and he, he or she is in a parliament dominated by um, members from a different party. And when it comes time, for example, to create a budget and to, for the parliament to approve the budget, there you have gridlock and, um, and that slows down the process of, of, of governance. Um, in small countries like ours where, um, you know, unlike the United States where, um, you know, their economy is strong and so on, would situations like those create problems insofar as it, it leads to uncertainty and um, undermines our economic progress if a uh, prime minister, for example, can't get a, a budget passed in, a par in the parliament? Okay, thank you for your critique. I accept it and I acknowledge it. <laughs> you don't disagree with it? I actually don't disagree with it, but I have to accept that with certain systems, especially in a society like ours, nothing can be 100% foolproof. So there is always room for improvement. So with implementing a system, unfortunately, it's always a trial and error, unfortunately. So you, 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 you think that um, in principle, 
it's the correct thing to have a directly elected prime minister and yes. that perhaps over time we can develop conventions and practices safeguards that... and so on okay all right the executive detectives agree with the prime minister being instated as the head of state for the republic of jamaica a strong sense of democracy is promoted through involving the voting citizenry to select their preferred prime minister while also embedding in them the power to remove them. A two-term limit is Sorry, whoever... Me, the, you, you mentioned the term limitation. I know you're nearly finished, so let me just ask you very okay. quickly, though. In a, in a small society, are you not unreasonably fettering the wishes of the voters by putting in place term limits when the fact is that we have the ultimate term limit when we go to the polls every five years, as Jamaica has done repeatedly since independence, and we kick out who we don't want in power. Why then, in a small society, say that even though this person is doing a fantastic job, they can't serve more than two terms? All right, thank you for your question. Uh, Matthew Bishop, he wrote an uh, uh, article slaying the West Monist when the West Monster in the Caribbean, constitutional reform in St. Minster and the Grenadines. And basically in his article, he was saying that even though we have the power and the propensity to re-elect who, who we want to be in charge of us over and over again, there still exists this possibility of stale blood. And he said that because of stale blood, our progress is stifled. So it doesn't leave much room for new persons to come in and have new ideas and so on. So I believe that in a case in which where we have term limits, no, we can have those who were once in a place of power to not be pushed out entirely, but probably to be in a position in which they can help those coming in. So they can, so they can go to them for consultation and advice. Um, very, very nice. Uh, just um, to ask, so, but don't you think that the people should decide whether or not it is that they want a particular elected official to continue? Uh, I understand your point about stale blood, but isn't it for the people to decide that? Yes, it is for the people to, to decide, but then also I feel as if, yes, it is for the people to decide, but there is this culture that we do not want to change, we're very resistant to change. So usually people don't really vote for persons because, especially in Jamaica, they don't vote for persons because of what their, the policies that they have. They vote for them because they're what they know and they're comfortable with them. All right. Thank you very much, um, Executive the, the oh, Detectives. I want to say one last thing. I wanted to commend Haile Kojo on his job um, recommendations. It was well received. Okay. Yeah, I'll allow that, yes. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, um, executive um, detectives. They have in, in investigated and um, provided their, their findings. Uh, we move next to the Democrats. Uh, this group uh, consists of uh, Leila Howell, Jane Martin, uh, Zidane Skeen, and they will be presenting on the executive. Um, again, we, are, we as commissioners are a little at a disadvantage because we didn't have the benefit of seeing a presentation, which may be good or bad. We'll see. Um, but go ahead. Good morning, everyone. To distinguish power, to regulate, to enhance, to protect, these are a few characteristics of an upright constitution. The executive branch is the vital root of the regulatory system, which must be established in its articulation. Through extensive analysis, Mr. Kojo should be praised for drafting such a commendable document. However, one wishes to place emphasis on errors which are ambiguous. According to Article 43A, which speaks to the Attorney General's power to interpret constitutional matters, we, the Democrats, suggest that the Office of Legal and Constitutional Affairs be appointed to duty, whilst the Attorney General focuses on civil matters begun by or brought against the state. The importance of this is to allow the OLACA to have a full meticulous focus on constitutional matters considering their importance. Furthermore, one wishes to highlight terms such as the mean and inviolable when making reference to the Prime Minister's position in Article 33A. The ambiguous terminology is puzzling, as one was reminded of the case McEwan versus the Attorney General, which states that there must be certainty to uh, prevent ambiguity or confusion in the minds of the Excuse me, especially since we hadn't seen your presentation before, 
Could you perhaps assist us by just saying in a sentence or two what you intend to focus on? Okay, as it relates to which point exactly or overall? Overall. Okay, we intend to look at um, the Prime Minister as it relates to his position and the power that he holds, as well as the Attorney General and certain terminologies that may seem as ambiguous. Okay. Conveniently, one must applaud Mr. Kutcher's reference to a specified period of time for elections under Article 33B. Under Art no. Sorry. Under Article 30. Sorry. Under Article 33B, as a fixed date will be see will be seen as a definite time frame to plan and organize elections effectively. Thank you. The Democrats have suggested that Article 33D of the Constitution, which imposes an age limit of 45 years for the position of the Prime Minister, might suggest discrimination and ageism. We also believe that the term any qualified person used in the article lacks certainty and could cause ambiguity or confusion. As established in the case of McEwan versus the Attorney General, there must be certainty under the law to prevent ambiguity or confusion. Um, don't you think, though, that imposing the 45-year um, age limit was uh, wise to ensure that the person who is in the position is somebody who has sufficient experience and perhaps maturity? Thank you for that question. I disagree because I believe that experience is not static it's something that is garnered through while well, it is garnered through years of practice we should also understand that 45 years or somebody being 45 years old isn't the only like age limit if you understand what i'm saying it isn't no could you could you elaborate a little bit more and okay. just to be clear is it that you're proposing no age limit, in which case an 18-year-old would be able to become prime minister? Well, no, that is not what we're suggesting. So can you tell us exactly what? We're suggesting that the age limit be lowered probably to 35, from 35 upwards, basically. But, but then, isn't you, aren't you getting kind of arbitrary then? You're objecting to 45, saying it's too old. Wouldn't, the same, wouldn't a 25-year-old be able to make the same argument about your 35 proposal? Well, no, I don't believe that a 25-year-old could make the same argument because we also acknowledge the fact that persons in politics, in order to gain full years of experience and understand the whole system, you have to be in there probably around five to 10 years. And seeing that many of these persons would go to college and you know get experience and you know get their degree, the limit that we would put it to is 35 years because that allows the person to develop fully and understand. As established in the case of McEwan versus the Attorney General, there must be certainty under the law to prevent ambiguity or confusion. In addition, the provision in Article 33C, which allows 10% of voters to petition for the removal of the Prime Minister, could lead to frequent attempts at impeachment due to the small number required. To prevent this, we suggest increasing the number of voters required for such petitions to 60% as seen in the Philippines, India, and most recently, Romania. Additionally, we commend Article 33G, which seeks to limit the overlap between the legislature and the executive, thus strengthening the separation of power doctrine. Excuse me. Putting in place thresholds that are almost impossible to reach, isn't that just an exercise in futility? Isn't that the, wouldn't that be the legislators uh, making a provision that sounds like they're, they're allowing a, a, recall, a, a, a mechanism, but in reality, not, because it'll never be reached. Well, I believe that that's your, um, that's your view of society, per se. Because in my no, opinion- I'm asking you a question. Um, I don't agree, because at the end of the day, I believe that if we educate citizens about voting and educate citizens about what impeachment actually is, and understanding how the government is working and, you know, allowing our citizens to be cognizant, then they will fully understand how the process of impeachment works. And most of them will come out when they believe that 
they should have the right to do it, essentially. All right. Um, your time is just really up. Um, so I'll just allow your closing statement. Okay. In conclusion, the Democrats view Haley Kirchner's draft as a positive step towards breaking away from colonial principles. However, we respectfully believe that certain sections of the Constitution require further review and amendment to ensure fairness and certainty. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Democrats. All right. um, so we are, we are at the last um, submission. So time, time has gone by. Um, this is from the Caribbean Coalition for Judicial Independence. Um, this group consists of Kenya Franklin, Alexander Hay, and Ayana Robinson. And they will present on a number of matters related to the security of tenure for, for judges. So at CC, the CCJI, go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. We commend Mr. Cujo on his civic engagement in Jamaica's impending republicanism. The Caribbean Coalition for Judicial Independence comprises Barbadians and Jamaicans who are captivated by constitutional reform as we both pursue this process. Chapter 4 is deeply entrenched and can only be amended by a supermajority and delay mechanisms. This safeguards the rule of law and enhances judicial independence. Further, Professor Simeon McIntosh describes Article 67 establishing the Caribbean Court of Justice as Jamaica's final appellate court as the essential last rite of passage to true nationhood and self-determination. We approve Article 70's constitutional protection of the parish courts mirroring Section 93 of the Belize Constitution for magistrates' courts. However, the absence of judges' security of tenure within Article 67 to 72 disregards the separation of powers and the rule of law. Well, the Article 68 says that um, uh, the Supreme Court shall be managed solely by the Office of the Chief Justice without interference from the Prime Minister um, or the Parliament. Um, isn't that a, a clear indication that the judiciary is being put in a position to uh, be free from any interference or control by the political branch? We are inclined to disagree because under the current constitution, judges of the Supreme Court, their offices are protected by a much stronger security of tenure. They hold their positions until retirement. It cannot be abolished during their tenure and they can only be removed for an inability to fulfill their duties or misconduct. And we believe that these provisions that he Included, Mr. Kujo, are wholly, are wholly insufficient to protect the sanctity of judicial power and Jamaican's right to a free and fair trial by an independent and impartial tribunal. So we believe that those honestly don't even qualify as a security of tenure. Well, let me take you a little bit further because as I know you would be aware, there is no sentence in the Jamaican constitution currently that speaks to judicial independence. We infer it from the security of tenure provisions, correct? And yet in the, in the Kuja draft, section 65 specifically is a statement of judicial independence saying the judges of every court in the country shall be independent. Doesn't this negate your argument in fact and suggest that your no. concerns are invalid? No, stating that something is independent does not make it independent. You have to take measures to ensure that the judiciary is independent in exercising its functions. And we don't believe that only stating that the judiciary is independent would do this. All right, proceed. Okay, thank you. Right, Independent Jamaica Council for Human Rights established that security of tenure assures the judiciary independence in their functions from the other branches and is a necessary feature of the rule of law. We also believe that the provision in Article 68E that provides for petition to the Prime Minister for a reduction in sentence offends the separation of powers. Hines and R establish that only the judiciary can determine the length of a sentence. But is this a situation where the executive is being given power to determine sentencing in an individual case? Or is it a situation, does it deal with a situation where the courts have already sentenced the person and the person is, is petitioning for mercy 
Um, it, it, in other words, is it um, a different way of framing what now exists in the Constitution that allows the Governor General, acting on the advice of the Privy Council, to, um, to reduce the sentence of somebody, um, either in whole or in, or, or in part? We believe that it's quite different because under this draft constitution, as it was said earlier, that the prime minister is um, elected by the people and serves this very broad executive function with many powers. And we believe that it's very different from a governor general acting on the advice of a privy council. And that's why we believe that this provision should be removed from this draft constitution because it would clearly be the executive factoring the discretion of the judiciary. Okay. We also believe that Article 68D impedes justice. This provides that the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, and the CCJ are appellate courts. This may overburden the parish courts with first instance litigation, thereby exacerbating the backlog in the court system. Since justice delayed is justice denied, we believe that this provision should be removed. We also recommend a retirement age of 75 for the Chief Justice and 70 for other judges. Let me interrupt you there. Justice Minister Derard Schock, last time this matter was in the public domain, said a lot of judges don't want to work till 70 or 75. So how does that impact? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be taken into account in terms of, of your recommendation there? We'll be honest, we didn't consider that factor. When we considered it, what we looked at was the security of tenure provision. And we also looked at biology. We wanted to look at an age that was not too old and not too young. But our main focus really, in terms of the security of tenure and also the independence of the judiciary, was that these judges, if they retire too early, some people might not be able to have the necessary funds to go and live on their own on their retirement. So then they might have to come and re-enter practice which could threaten the independence of the judiciary because they would be trying cases to be heard by judges that are on the bench that they were previously on. Um, short time, I think you have one more point. I'll allow you to make it. So we strongly believe that the prime minister should not appoint the judiciary. We believe that judges should be appointed by a judicial and legal services commission, which includes civil society members and judges and that the position of the Chief Justice should be advertised to the public to limit the Prime Minister's discretion in these positions. Okay, sorry, on, on, on that point, uh, I think the proposal is for the Prime Minister to appoint and the Parliament to, to vet, which I interpret to mean a, a parliamentary vote on whether um, a, a judge should be confirmed to office or not, as a procedure that now exists in the United States, um, for example. Um, in the context of a constitution that gives um, judges the final say on the, the, the content of our laws, including um, you know, human rights provisions and gives them the power to strike down legislation that has been enacted by a democratic, democratically elected parliament, um, shouldn't the political branches have some input in determining the, um, um, whether somebody is uh, appropriate for for judicial office having regard to the significant power that the judge will hold um, after being appointed? We agree with what you are saying to an extent, which is why I, I probably misspoke in saying that the Prime Minister should not appoint the judiciary. I probably, said, I probably should have said that the Prime Minister should not appoint the judiciary on the Prime Minister's own. I probably should have said that instead. So I respect what you're saying, and I don't think we considered it to that extent. And we would review that later when we look at the Constitution in later times. All right. Um, OK, the time is up. I, I, I'd like to probe that one a little bit more, but uh, we're, on a, we're on a strict schedule. Uh, thank you very much, Caribbean Coalition for uh, Judicial Independence. Um, assembly, please applaud them. All right, so um, we're at the end of the uh, submissions. Um, this, this will. Uh, we w the commissioners will ensure that there are more um, um, assemblies across the, across the country to get the full, full feedback uh, from everyone. But this is all we can, we can manage for, for the, at this point in time. Um, so right now we're going to have a look at the voting results. 
um, arising from presentations five to eight, and I therefore hand over to Professor Robinson. Thank you very much, commissioners. Uh, I also want to give the commissioners a chance to confer a little bit um, about your presentations. Um, I, I'm not a commissioner, I'm simply a teacher along with them. And um, I, I have to say at this stage how extraordinarily impressed I am um, by the presentations today. And I want us to join in congratulating the 20 students who prepared today. I did, yes, you're free to um, confer in or outside of the room. I mean, I, I, I have a sense, and I think someone like Justice Batts knows very well the lay of the land. These are students who learned the cases, looked at constitutional provisions around the Caribbean in thinking through um, their response. And um, I dare say, as their teachers walk out the room, um, they have been well taught by a body of um, tutors with considerable experience, both in the classroom and outside in the area. We're going to share the results from the Constituent Assembly. So back to the people uh, and to hear some of your thoughts on the last four presentations. So should Jamaica retain a nominated Senate, and I have to go a little bit closer, and I may borrow this to give me a chance to see. You must know that vision is imperiled when you reach a certain age. I am well past it. Uh, so should the Jamaica retain a nominated Senate? The majority felt it should retain a Senate, but that Senate should be elected. A similar number thought it should retain a Senate with changes to include independent senators. Um, nobody thought the Senate should be abolished, so there's a lot of support for an upper chamber, um, and only seven thought that the nominated Senate, as it exists now, should continue. Uh, let's take the second of the questions in this group. Should Jamaica adopt a presidential system um, or um, retain the parliamentary system or consider a hybrid system? The majority thought this was time for a significant shift towards a presidential system. You heard some questions posed um, about um, a system in which there's a stronger separation of powers. Um, but a significant number thought that there should be a hybrid. Notice only a minority um, had the view that the existing parliamentary system should be retained. Next question. If you support Jamaica becoming a republic, tell us why. So give us some of the reasons. And the answers include, we would become truly independent. You noticed how significant this question was to Simeon McIntosh. Um, I support it because Barbados did it. <laughs> Interesting answer. Uh, uh, and um, a couple people saying, um, it's connected to independence. Some have said it's time to move on, uh, that the monarchy is symbolic representation of the past, doesn't have a current role in our society. Uh, Jamaica becoming a republic, I support it because the crown is just a figurehead, so it's the idea that the function is not significant in any event. And some didn't support Jamaica becoming a republic. Um, would be wonderful later to hear some more of your thoughts there. Um, and uh, some connected to the idea of indigenous lawmaking in the country. Uh, some have said that it is the best way to end the late legacy of colonialism and slavery that has kept us chained to England. Uh, and I also hear general consensus. Um, so a note that uh, Jamaicans, Jamaicans have moved closer to this position. Um, the question is how and what kind of republic would we become? Uh, Barbados, uh, in a sense, um, left that question for the current constitutional reform process. And the last question. So 
We asked one question relating to the independence of the judiciary, and it was around what role should the Prime Minister play uh, in the selection of judges in the context of Jamaica, the most senior judges, uh, the President of the Court of Appeal and the, Pri and the Chief Justice. And um, uh, 10 persons said that there should be an independent commission that advises the Prime Minister on um, a relevant um, short list to be, oh sorry, yes, that should advise on the appointment of the Chief Justice, my apologies. Not advise the Prime Minister, should advise probably the Head of State uh, on the appointment. Um, another eight thought the Prime Minister could direct, but the Prime Minister needed uh, to receive a short list of qualified persons from an independent body. Uh, there are a few who thought there was no need for change, that we should maintain the system, um, which gives complete decision-making to the Prime Minister who must simply consult the leader of the opposition. And then a very small minority um, thought that we should consider the Trinidad model in which the President actually determines who is the Chief Justice uh, after um, consulting the Prime Minister and leader of the opposition, of course, that has to be a head of state who enjoys some security of tenure, could not be a governor general. Um, so that reflects some of your views as the Constituent Assembly during the course of um, the eight sets of submissions on a range of topics about each of the branches of government, but also the Bill of Rights and some of the preliminary early parts of the Constitution around supremacy, um, the opening values, um, as well, and the very important question of entrenchment. Uh, so thank you for your participation, and I'm going to hand over for a brief um, presentation by Haile Mikhail Kujo um, of Poetry before the commissioners return. Students, thank you for your assessment. It's back to the drawing board as soon as I leave here. I have a few meetings to get involved with some other people, and then by the end of April, I'll put out another draft. I support Jamaica becoming a republic because it frees us to be us. I'm getting help here. This is a Acrostic poem. A Bloodless Revolution by Haile Mikhail Kojo, Saturday, January 21, 2023, copyright Voice Imprint Publishing Limited. Right now, the real talk in our country should be enacting we desire to get rid of the British monarchy, plain and straight, get rid of them fallacy. And do the stranglehold them have power legally by changing the constitution that them give to we. Listen, me people, I am talking revolution, ignited by we desire for long lasting self determination. Constitution change that benefits everyone. Jamaicans, for the most part, have one thing in common. All the way are people of color according to European categorization. Maybe Chinese, Indian, Syrian, Taino, African. All the way down pressed by the British Divide and Rule 1962 Constitution. I am already make a proposal that can help we achieve the, con the revolution. Clean and neat without it being a bloody one. All it takes is parliamentary ratification. 
No need to fear what others may say or do. Only keep on treading in our eternal Father's way for true. Working together in truth and justice each and every day. Have you seen the meaning behind this poem? Yeah, you agree with it? All right, we'll say it now. Now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, students. Thank you very much, Ali Mikhail. I'm now going to invite the Honorable Mr. J Justice David Batts to offer some concluding remarks, having spent very kindly during his leave the two hours with us. Justice Batts, these are students who know you from your presence in this faculty last semester. Um, many of them purchased your book. Um, I'm sure you'll meet them outside asking to autograph copies of the book. Um, but it's a real pleasure to have you here again and to offer us some concluding remarks. The floor is yours. Good, good afternoon, I think it is now. It's still morning? Morning. Good afternoon, after 12, yes. Uh, well, let me first congratulate Professor Robinson on an innovative educational tool um, and approach, which is, of course, no surprise. I am really impressed. I am not going to give judgment on any of the presentations. <laughs> I stay away from the debate as much as possible. But I, in a few minutes, just make some observations for us to keep in mind, and which came across in the presentations, the importance of our history and our past not to be forgotten. It impacts us even today. In another forum, I posited that the fact that the majority of people here in this country were excluded pragmatically from the mainstream not only of the politics, but of the economics of the society, until as recently as 1962. Um, that is really when um, one could say that everybody, in theory at any rate, should have been involved. One of the results of that history is that Anansi became a, a hero. And Anansiism, a way of life. It, it is, it, it, it can, so it's still impacting us. I want to comment on two or three little things quickly. The re reference to age, I found it very interesting and whether or not there should be an age limit on the, the leader. Let us remember Alexander the Great, before he was 30, conquered an empire that, that ended in India, to, he took over almost half of India. And what was most interesting about Alexander was that he implemented a system of inclusiveness in his governance, which was ahead of his time. So let us not underestimate what can happen um, people, young people. Let us not, let us not rule, rule that out. Um, knowledge. I love the pushback on the issue of referenda. The fact that referenda have failed should not be the end of the argument. Let us look at the question whether or not 
the knowledge base, the information has been made available and how and whether or not um, that should be a focus. Indeed, it's interesting that the responses, the majority of responded, tended to be the one that one found most agreeable. And why? The persons voting are persons who have a modicum of information about what we are discussing. The pushback on the question of the method of appointment of the judge and whether we should somehow follow the example of our neighbors to the north. I would urge everyone to consider Alan Dershowitz's impressive treaty, Supreme Injustice. He ends his book by advocating for the system here because of the disaster that, that divisive politics can have on the judiciary. And it's playing out right in our very eyes, in our neighbors to the north. So let us all commit ourselves to enhance people's knowledge and information and bringing people into the mainstream in whatever way we can. So let me encourage you, students, to share your knowledge as you go forward. Congrats on the quality of your excellent presentation. I must say, and again, give kudos to Tracy. As a, as a I'm sorry, professor. <laughs> but as a student, I, I never had the opportunity to stand before a microphone. It didn't happen until I was pretty well advanced in my legal education, and I had to push myself forward. Now it seems to be a part of the whole educational process. It can only augur well for yourself as advocates, because it's not easy to get up and hear your, your own voice. And, and congrats that you are, you are introducing it at this early stage. So well done, well done, and I'm certainly encouraged for what is to come in Jamaica, in our future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice Batts. And um, thank you to all of you who are here today, especially uh, to the students who led and the commissioners. But I want to hand over to end today's proceedings to the commissioners for their comments on uh, the on the submissions and of the participation of um, this robust group of students. Over to you. We'll be doing uh, just a two part. I'll be giving you a couple of general comments and then Jeffrey will be giving some more specific comments as well as the results. And again, before I start, once again, congratulations, guys. I mean, really, really, big up, big up, big up yourself. Come, clap yourself. Good job. All right. A couple of general points. Remember that submissions, your written submissions are to assist the panel, whether it's the commissioners or a bench of judges. So you do want your submissions to be as clear as possible. Basic stuff like labeling, you know, I should know who it's from, name, team, um, the exercise, and so on. And as well, not asking for anything fancy, but just, again, basic information so we can identify what it is we're looking at. As well, you, have, you always want to get straight to the point, whether you're making submissions before a judge or any kind of written submissions. It's not a six-form essay, so you don't need to spend two paragraphs giving us kind of general background that's, you know, not relevant. You want to, bam, get straight to the point. I'm addressing the panel on this. These are my arguments. And as well, you want your references to be specific. If you're referring to a specific portion of the Constitution, don't just say the Constitution. Tell me you're referring to Section 63B, because again, remember, the purpose of the submissions are to, is, is for the assistance of the panel and to make me able to follow your arguments a little bit more easily. Now, in terms of deadlines, 
you got to make your deadlines, guys. So if you have a deadline for submission, your, de your submission needs to come in. Now, having said that, let's say your submission didn't come in. What a, sub what a solution, one solution I would suggest is that you come very early in the morning with your hard copy, you apologize, and you offer them to the judges or the, the commissioners at that stage because we'd probably still have had been able to read them and then that again would have assisted us more in being able to evaluate your presentations. Um, don't feel obliged to say thank you for that question every time we ask a question. The respect shows in the manner in which you respond, you don't need to thank, you know, just get straight to the answer. Then no, you always have to take your cue from the bench, from the panel or from the judges. If they're leading you in a particular direction, you need to be astute as to what it is they want you to get to and to pick it up. So for instance, again, the commissioners very gently pointed out to a few of the groups that we hadn't had the benefit of, of your sub written submissions. So therefore, we'd be having a little bit of difficulty, but nobody apologized. That was a clear indication that if, if the apology hadn't come before, it really should have come at that point. So you again, you want to be very alert for those kinds of very gentle cues and nudges that are coming from the, from the commissioners. You also just want to be very careful when you get into the cut and thrust to make sure you never veer over into sounding disrespectful. Never. It always has to be, as again, respect doesn't come from the fact that you're saying respectfully, but comes from how you frame your response and, and how accommodating and open you are to the points being made. I, I love the fact that at some point, I think it was a judicial independence group and one of the other groups, you know how to concede a point. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic when the judge makes a point and you realize that you really don't have any good answer to say, you know, something, I agree with that or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent feature of being able to debate as well as of advocacy. Jeffrey. Uh, thank you. And my own congratulations to all the part participants. Um, our aim is to finish at about 12.03. Um, so I have about three minutes to keep things um, um, on schedule. Uh, my general remarks are geared towards just highlighting some of what stood out for us across the various uh, presentations. Um, we thought the Jamaica Sovereignty uh, Coalition gave a very strong um, uh, oral submissions that enhanced what was in the, the written submissions and clarified the thinking that was um, at, at play in developing the written submissions. Uh, Team Supreme uh, stood out for its very innovative um, way of presenting, uh, alternated between, between the speakers and it you know, provided a, um, a different feel to the, to the, to the ears and uh, maintained a level of, of, of interest in what, what was about to, to take place. Uh, the Jamaicans for Justice and um, Sovereignty uh, had a, a fairly constructive um, way of engaging with a particular aspect of the, the culture draft and reflecting on what exists and what exists across the, the region and, and making some, some proposals. I'm very much um, interested in um, you know, which provisions of a constitution in where you have a tiered system should be subjected to you know, a referendum procedure versus uh, matters that should be reserved to Parliament and, and so on. And um, that it's likely to be one of the, the points of discussion as Jamaica enters another phase of, of constitutional uh, uh, reform. Uh, the repeat of, of offenders we thought had um, very good um, written um, submissions and did a good job in extrapolating on it in the, in the oral uh, and, and responding to some of the, the questions that we, we put to them. Um, the provisions on the, that, the aspect of the submissions dealing with the status of the child, uh, we thought uh, warranted special, uh, special common commendations. It, 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 it stood out um, a, a lot. Um, the Unity Alliance um, had a very vibrant um, presentation, and uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the choice of um, fixed election dates and the the problems that can arise um, with, with that feature. Um, um, the, the, the group was very passionate about making 
those, those points. And we, we, took, we, we, we understood uh, where you were coming from in that regard. Um, the executive um, the detectives also had um, one of the, the better presentations, better oral presentations, and in response to questions, uh, was able to identify um, some of the authorities from the, the reading list that was, that was pro provided, an authority which I don't think was referenced in the written submissions. Um, so you, you showed an ability to synthesize what you, what you read and call upon it on the moment to, to respond. I thought that was very good. Uh, the, the Democrats um, also provided um, 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 uh, passionate um, submissions um, uh, to us. Uh, we, the, 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 the questions came at a, at a fairly rapid, rapid pace, and uh, that takes some getting used to. Um, over time, you will, you will master that, that skill. The Caribbean Coalition for Judicial Independence uh, we thought um, had very strong um, written and, and oral presentations, um, also had the ability to uh, res respond to the questions we put to them in a, in a way that resisted some of the points that uh, the commissioners made, as well as um, accepting certain points and um, conceding to the need for further um, consideration. So. When we come to consider the um, two categories uh, for which we want to make overall um, prizes, I don't know if there are prizes available, um, uh, the, the best overall team, um, we think, um, sorry, best speaker, oh, see, I'm, I'm being directed to, to the best speaker first. Uh, the best uh, speaker, in our view, um, represented the Jamaican Sovereignty Coalition, Clavia Williams. Right. Uh, con yes. Yes. Congratulations, you were, you were very clear, uh, you were very good at responding to, to the questions that we, that we put to you, and uh, I, I look forward to tracking your, your trajectory as, a, uh, as an advocate or a speaker or whatever path you, you choose going forward. Um, very clear, very impressive. Um, commendations um, in this regard as well to um, Amoya Lynn and uh, Ayana Robinson, who, yes, yes, uh, who we thought um, st stood out in uh, their ability to um, articulate their points in a very clear way and to respond to our questions without being um, uh, too, 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 too flustered. So that brings us now to the best team and the consideration here uh, was the quality of the written submissions the quality of the oral um, submissions, ability to respond uh, to, to, to questions, and uh, overall uh, clarity in the points made, uh, as well as the um, ability to constructively engage with the draft, that is to say, to make uh, proposals for improvement. And uh, all factors considered, we think the best team um, ended the day, and it's the Caribbean Coalition for Judicial Independence. And it, 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 it helps that it was a, a diverse team nationality-wise, right? So we, the um, Caribbean unity helped to um, add, a, add some flavor to, to all, that was, all that was done. Uh, so overall, uh, again, uh, thank you all for taking, taking the time to uh, uh, prepare your, your submissions, which did involve reading material that's not necessarily um, totally connected to the, the, the course content, so you had to go out um, of the, the classroom uh, a little bit. Uh, you also had to subject yourself uh, to some degree of uh, training and coaching, and overall, you have helped us to provide um, a very excellent fifth Mona Law uh, public debate on a topic that is uh, timely, and which you all, as, as, as students, will hopefully um, be engaged in as the reform proposals here in Jamaica, in Barbados, and in other parts of the Caribbean um, um, take off in the, in the coming years. Uh, so thank you all for attending, and uh, for those of you who are in my tutorials, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>
that's, that's it? Okay.